morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this live broadcast on Russia South Africa investment opportunities coming to you from Johannesburg, where the BRICS Summit is in session. Joining me on stage, we have Mr. Paul Mashatile, Treasurer General of the African National Congress, Mr. Kirill Lipa, CEO, Trans Mash Holding Group. Mr. Stavros Nikolaou, Senior Executive, Strategic Trade Development at Aspen Pharmacare, and Mr. Mark Patridge, Vice President, Gazprom Bank. Thank you very much for joining me. Yes. Treasurer General, we're going to start with the history of relations between Russia and South Africa. You are laying the groundwork for this morning's discussion. Please go ahead, sir. Well, firstly, let me uh, welcome our visitors. Uh, from all over the world who are here. Uh, we have a very long history with Russia, as many of you may be aware that in the early years of apartheid, uh, the African National Congress had the support of the Soviet Union. Uh, many of our guys were trained there militarily, but they also went to universities there. So once we were liberated, we revived uh, that relationship uh, President Mandela visited uh, Russia uh, in 1996, Tabo Mbeki uh, also. And in Russia currently is one of the countries where we you know, have relaxed visa requirements. Uh, so you can travel to Russia anytime those of you want to do business there. And this uh, happened in May 2017 where 2017 you relaxed the already, visa yes, requirements. Uh, so, so we are very excited. In fact, what I want to say this morning is I want to see trade between South Africa and Russia growing even bigger than where it is now at about eight billion. Uh, so we need more Russian companies to come here to invest. We want South African companies to go to Russia. So those who are already here, uh, I'm excited to welcome you. And if you have uh, challenges and problems, come and see me. So, Kirill, let's bring yeah. you in in terms of celebrating Russia's, Russian business in South Africa. Trans, uh, Transmash Holding Group investing half a billion rand, the announcement made mm. last week, into the railway supply chain. Can you tell us why South Africa, sir? Well, first of all, let me say hello to everybody, ladies and gentlemen. After mm. so impressive dancing, which we have seen, it's quite, quite <laughs> difficult to be the same level, I would say, not to make our discussion very boring. So, uh, our company is uh, very well known in Russia. We are the largest manufacturer of rolling stock. We are producing all kind of rolling stock, which is on the ground and under the ground. So, in, uh, as you know, Russia is one of the largest uh, railway country in the world. So we are in top three, I would say, and we have around 90,000 kilometers all across Russia from the west to the east. Mm -hmm. uh, our company is producing, as I've said, all kind of rolling stock. So we are absolutely experienced in locomotive and passenger coaches, metro coaches, uh, DMUs, EMUs, everything. So. But we have also one of the very important, I would say, uh, distinguish uh, or I would say uh, uh, we, we, are, we are the only one company or one of a few companies in the world which is privately owned. We are 80 percent of our company belong to the private individuals and we are in top three as a manufacturer producer in the world. So you can in, in terms of number of units we are producing everywhere so, uh, every year. So that's why our company is very much, uh, how to say, filled by entrepreneurial spirits. And we have international partner, uh, which is Alstom, mm. and they own 20% of our group right now. Uh, we developed our business uh, looking, f looking on our peers in the world, like General Electric, like Alstom, like Siemens, and we want to be, how to say, very good in terms of quality and in terms of relationships with the client. So what we know from our experience in Russia, we know that the clients are absolutely different all over the world. So you, you cannot have the same client or the same company with the same traditions, with the same way of managing business, with the same difficulties which uh, the client has everywhere in the world. So 
That's why you have to be very close to the client. And our idea is that we don't want to bring our products from Russia, so we are not keen to load our factories in Russia. Our idea is to develop local business where we want to develop. So we are not bringing locomotives. We are bringing entrepreneurial spirits. This is our idea. Uh, and the investments which were uh, announced last week uh, are the, how to say, this, like a symbol or benchmark of this, uh, of this idea and of this investment plan. Uh, we are looking to, uh, private, uh, to buy the, the DCD company, and uh, this company has long experience in production of locomotives and boogies, so we want to be a really local producer in South Africa. So this is an idea. So Kirill, can, can we just uh, elaborate on that local partnerships with Transmash Holding? Can you flesh that out a little bit for me? Well, uh, here we have our local partner, which name is Mjisa. Uh, and uh, we are jointly owned uh, company, which name is TMH Africa. So, and our idea is, as I've told you, to, to develop jointly the, the knowledge and the business of uh, rolling stock production. Stavros, your experience when it comes to Russia, South Africa opportunities. Okay, uh, Bronwyn, firstly, uh, thanks very much for having me on the show. It's mm. a great pleasure to be here. Uh, Aspen is a reasonably new entrant into the Russian market. We've been operating there for about three years, uh, there or thereabouts. Um, Aspen today as a company is, is a global leader in anesthetics injectable thrombosis product. Mm -hmm. In fact, we're number one in the world in anesthetics outside of the US, number two in injectable thrombosis products also outside the US. So, so naturally, those were going to be the products that we would first introduce into, into the Russian market. We, uh, we set up operations there. We presently have in excess of 150 employees, largely in um, marketing and sales, so 150 employees. In, in Russia, and we cover all the, all the provinces and all the geographies of, of Russia. And Russia is a massive country, as you'll recognize, and we spread our resources across the, the various geographies. What, what uh, sort of our initial experience was that we, you know, we've invested heavily in South Africa um, to, to, to service export markets out of South Africa. When we went to Russia, we encountered some pretty strong localization rules. And uh, your, your products won't be listed on drug formularies that the hospitals use unless you embrace those localization rules. So I think we're trying to see how we best navigate around that. And uh, the sort of the mutual solution found, it's not always ideal because you always want to have economies of scale where you manufacture and leverage those economies of scale, but we have found a mutual solution around uh, a technology partner. So we have got a partner in Russia that we're transferring the technologies to. Was it easy to identify that partner, Stavros? Look, I think, Bronwyn, you know, pharmaceutical products are very complex to manufacture. And when you start talking about injectable anticoagulants, it's even more, more complex. So we had to mm. do a, a thorough due diligence. It took a lot of time a lot of effort to, to find the right partner. But I am pleased to say our partner is Nanalek. They're in the Kirov region, which is about a two-hour flight from Moscow. And we have already completed phase one of the technology transfer of a product called Fraxiparin, which is an injectable anticoagulant. And it's a, it's a complex technology to make. We have commenced with phase two, or we're signing an MOU to commence phase two. And we're also in discussions to introduce a product uh, called Erixtra, which is also an anticoagulant, but has a slightly different positioning in the market. So to answer your question, yes, there were challenges, challenges remain, but I think you navigate those challenges. And I think what's, what's interesting for us is that President Putin's announcement to invest more in healthcare. So previously the per capita GDP, uh, sorry, the per capita investment in healthcare is pretty low relative to other jurisdictions, EU and other neighboring territories in the CIS. So I think that presents an opportunity. And also Russia has reasonably high um, strokes, incidence and prevalence of strokes, cardiovascular disease, and things like blood clots in the legs 
in the lungs, pulmonary emboli, not get too technical on the program here. But those are... It sounds very depressing, areas. I have to say. No, it is. I'm Can we maybe leave that and we'll go? <laughs> no, we'll come back. We'll come back, Stavros, and, and leave the medical terminology. <coughs> Mark, let me bring you in as Gaz Problem Bank. And what's so interesting about this conversation is that we've got South African companies investing in Russia. We've got Russian companies investing in South Africa. And it's these case studies that, for me, speak volumes about what is happening on the ground. Mm. So if you can, sir, give us a sense sure. of your operation in South Africa. Absolutely. Uh, you see, uh, Gazprom Bank um, is one of the, uh, the biggest banks in, uh, in Russia, uh, and in particular leader in project financing and the financing of long-term investments. We, uh, we decided some years ago to, 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 to build a, a presence in the, in the BRICS, and in particular in Africa, <coughs> we're in South Africa through GPB Africa. Uh, to, to develop the synergies between, uh, between Russia and, uh, and Africa. So uh, for a few years now I've been invited to participate in the works of the, uh, the BRICS uh, Business uh, Council. And um, I discovered uh, actually that this was an excellent forum to exchange experiences uh, because we have been, each of the countries of the BRICS have been developing their own experience in, in building infrastructure, in building energy, and uh, the sharing of best practice between the countries has been extremely, extremely helpful. Over the last few years, uh, there has been a tremendous development of uh, infrastructure and the development of the financing of infrastructure for a bank like us. Um, and we have been learning from the experiences of, of South Africa. Then what we're doing here also is to develop the opportunities for Russian companies to work in Africa, and particularly in South Africa, um, and uh, for South African companies to, to, to work in, the, in Russia. Treasurer General, let's come yes. back. Uh, you elaborated on the political relationship between South Africa and Russia, which in all regards is strong. So we go back to those numbers that are on the table from a trade perspective, and 5 billion rand in 2012 in terms of trade between Russia and South Africa. You mentioned that that has grown to 8 billion 2016. Should those numbers not be higher, and what can we do to fast track if we've got that political solidarity that you referred to? Well, <clears throat> the numbers should be higher. Uh, so in fact, what we should do as South Africa is to create the environment to attract uh, more uh, investors from Russia to South Africa, and of course vice versa. So we need to increase trade between our two countries. Uh, <clears throat> so what we're going to do is to say to uh, those who are interested to come to South Africa from Russia, these are the sectors that you can look into. For instance, energy. Um, South Africa is in need of more investment in energy. Um, so whether you want to invest in gas or you want to look at renewables, um, as you know that recently the Minister of Energy has uh, announced the appointment of independent power producers. There's going to be another round of, of those uh, uh, appointments. So there's an opportunity there. Uh, but also infrastructure. Um, it's an area where we, we're looking at investing a lot. The president has already said he wants to raise $100 billion in five years. I think we'll do it in a year, actually. Um, that's a, that's a bullish outlook. Look, yeah. Uh, and I, it does definitely deserve a clap. Uh, as you know, Brenwin, uh, already uh, the president has announced $20 billion from Saudi and UAE and uh, yesterday, China said they are putting 14.7 billion. Uh, I'm sure Russia is going to try and match that. Uh, <laughs> well, the rand is strengthening <laughs> on the back of all these deals as they come through yeah. in leaps so, and bounds. So, in short, I'm saying I think let's increase trade volumes between South Africa and Russia. Kirill, what do you look for when investing in a country? So. If the Treasurer General is saying, let's make it easier for you to do business in South Africa, here's your opportunity. What's your wish list? Well, it's quite long. <laughs> we, have, we have time. <laughs> no, I'm, I, it's a joke. Uh, our 
uh, wish list is quite short. Uh, we need just cooperative mood uh, from a political level because uh, our business is pretty much connected to the political ambitions and desire of politicians to develop public transportation or cargo transportation. So uh, we can produce rolling stock which can move only on the tracks, unfortunately. Mm. Or fortunately, I don't know. <laughs> so that's why before we sell or produce uh, the rolling stock, we need tracks. So that's why the infrastructure development is quite important in the country. And I guess infrastructure development uh, across the whole history of the world was the main factor of the country's development and economy development. So that's why I strongly believe that if there is real ambition of uh, the political circus and of the government of the country to develop the country, it should develop infrastructure first of all. And uh, we are following this development and we don't need anything. We do, do, did it by ourselves in Russia and we are ready to do it by ourselves here. So. Well, those are the kind of partners that you definitely need from a South African perspective. Last week you made announcements around ESCOM. And when, it talks, when we come to infrastructure development, you spoke about energy. And I think perhaps, Treasurer General, this is the point for you to just give us a sense as to the infrastructure development around ESCOM, the restructuring of ESCOM that you alluded to. Uh, yes, I think there are a lot of discussions uh, currently going on in ESCOM. As many of you know that uh, ESCOM is one of the biggest uh, parastatals that we have. They are actually the engine of driving the South African economy because of uh, the big input they make in, in the supply of electricity. And we need to make sure that we are able to restructure and get ESCOM to operate efficiently. Um, and one of the things that we, we've agreed to do as, as the ruling uh, party is that we want to invite private investors into our parastatals. Um, of course, there was a lot of debate as to whether we will privatize um, some of them, and our view was that let's steer away from privatization for now, but invite private partners who want to, to take equity stakes, invest. Uh, some of our parastatals, of course, also are looking for loans, uh, but where we can get investors to come in, we would appreciate that. So ESCOM is one of those places where this can happen. Uh, <clears throat> there's a lot of discussion about how do you make ESCOM operate efficiently. Uh, and my view, of course, is that you could uh, break it up into different operating units, uh, others dealing with transmission, uh, generation and distribution, but that, that discussion is going on, but we need to get it you right. We are inviting investors, and this is probably the appropriate yeah. platform yeah. to put it out there. Stavros, sometimes we forget about the, the softer touch points, and we don't talk about the cultural differences. Having been on the ground in Russia, can you give us a sense, and obviously I'm going to ask it uh, the other way around as well. So, um, Mark, if you can prepare yourself for that. But Stavros, <laughs> give me a sense of, of some of those cultural challenges. And, and again, it's honest, robust debate. We're starting to understand one another as players. So I, I think, uh, Bronwyn, look, there's, there, there are going to be cultural differences wherever you trade globally. So I think that the point here is, were they sort of more intense in Russia than we've experienced anywhere else in the world? And, and I think the answer to that is no. I mean, the, the Russians have got a very particular way of operating. I think building trust is very important. Um, so I think a lot of times being invested in, in building trust with the, with the authorities, getting the right team in place, the right management team in place, that are able to, to understand and bridge those cultural differences. And, and I think we've done that successfully now. Um, of, of course, with cultural differences go understanding the, the landscape and the environment that you're operating in. So I, I think most markets these days are, despite attempts to deregulate, because we talk a lot about deregulation, but uh, I think you find around the world that regulation, particularly in pharmaceuticals, remains a big point of cultural difference. So I, th I think the BRICS relationship is important in trying to deregulate some of the, the business constraints and making the ease of 
operating in those markets a lot more attractive. So I marry up culture very much with the ease of doing business in a jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. And I think we have got some way to go within BRICS. I, I can speak with some authority around it because I sit on the BRICS Business Council. And it is an area of attention and focus. So I think overall, to answer your question, yes, there have been cultural differences. They're no better or worse than you find anywhere else. We have largely bridged them, and the management team that you put in place is very important in bridging those cultural differences. Oh. Can I push you slightly on some of the key cultural differences, or would you prefer not to delve into that at this no, point? No, I, th I, th I think, you know, Bronwyn, they're not, they're not incredibly vast. We say, look, it's, you know, people are unre completely unreasonable and inoperative. I think it's more issues around style and management style that you've got to start bridging. You know, all jurisdictions have got different management styles. But as I keep saying, you know, you've got to have the right team on the ground to bridge those. Mark, let's turn the equation around. Sure. And well, uh, the first thing I would say is that uh, coming from a Russian perspective, I, I fully appreciate the South African concept of winter. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> uh, but uh, I would say that, of course, um, it, it is striking when you look at the BRICS. It, it could hardly be more different. You have four, com five diff completely different cultures, histories, um, but all our very languages, uh, languages uh, it, 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 it would be hard to imagine more different uh, horizons. And yet, what really strikes me is the convergence, the, how useful it is to, uh, to compare experiences, to learn from one another, um, and how in practice, in, in, in business deals, um, there has been over the past uh, 10, 15 years, there has been a, a truly uh, moving a certain convergence because we have been facing some of the same, uh, some of the same constraints, some of the the, the same challenges in developing um, energy, in developing uh, infrastructure. Yes, there has been different. There is a very strong tradition in in energy, for example, in in, in Russia, and that can be useful to to other countries in the in the BRICS. Um, but there, it, it gives rise to a lot of very good cooperation. And uh, what I do see is how we are indeed moving forward in a way that does create opportunities uh, between the BRICS. And I have to, to, rem to, to remind everyone that it's not in necessarily in isolation. Um, it can also be the BRICS working together with countries outside of the BRICS, and we can, as BRICS, we can work, South Africa and Russia can work together in third-party countries throughout, throughout Africa, for example. And collaborate and on collaborate, the And collaborate, exactly, in, in those third-party countries, and I see that as a huge field for growth. Stavros, let me, from the BRICS Business Council perspective, do you see sharing of best practice among Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa? Bronwyn, you know the, the council was incepted and established five years ago in Durban. And I, th I think the bridging in, in differences and the convergence, uh, the convergence co commercially, culturally, even politically, because I mean there is a degree of politics between when trade wars are playing out. I, I think the, so the, the, the improvement over that five years has been staggering. And there's, there's so much of a greater alignment these days and convergence. And I think mm -hmm. as we move along with this uh, relationship within the BRICS formation, and we start to unlock the mutual values that are emerging from that, I think the relationship and the convergence will go from strength to strength. And I mean, I know that there's been a lot of skepticism back home. I mean, does BRICS really work for something? What does it mean for the man on the street? I mean, all those questions have been sort of playing out. And, and, and I think you're not going to get immediate benefits, but I think the benefits are starting to manifest now. Mm -hmm. Just for example, I think BRICS is, is a fantastic counterweight to the trade wars that are playing out. You know, a small economy like ours in South Africa, you, you can easily get caught up in crossfires. So to have that counterweight, I mean, if it does nothing else, I mean, just to have that counterweight is already a point of strong convergence for me. Kirill, your, your thoughts on BRICS and the synergies that we're starting to unlock between the territories? Uh, <clears throat> well, I think that um, BRICS is excellent opportunity for the development of the countries, for sure. Uh, right now, uh, China, India, 
uh, are the most fast growing economies in the world. So mm -hmm. everybody wants to, how to say, to, to follow this uh, strategy and to get high levels of uh, the development of the national economy. So my understanding is that the more closer we will be together, the, the better solutions and the better levels of this grow, growth we will get. So that's why I think that uh, we should do business together. Treasurer General, yes. President Ramaphosa appointed the Honorable Deputy President David Mabuza as a speci special envoy to, to Russia to renew Russia-South Africa relations in May of this year. Do you think that this is going to ignite, you know, we spoke about getting that number up from the 8 billion rand in 2016 that was disclosed. Is this appointment going to fast track the relationship? Indeed. Uh, in fact, our relations with uh, Russia are at the strongest at the moment. Uh, uh, President Putin arrives this morning, hopingly. Uh, and that is an indication that uh, we want to see our relations uh, strengthening. Uh, we want to see more Russian companies investing here, South African companies investing in, in, in Russia. Uh, so we, 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 we are busy attending to all issues that will strengthen our relationship. One of the things we are doing as South Africa is to make sure that uh, BRICS can also impact on the continent. Uh, the president has invited most of the heads of states from SADC uh, to the BRICS uh, summit. And we want to see South Africa as a gateway into the region and the continent. And that's how we will work with uh, uh, the other countries uh, in, in, in this BRICS uh, uh, alliance to make sure that it's not just relating to the four countries, but it's a, it's a way also of going together into other countries to, to do infrastructure projects, to invest there, and make sure that we can help not only grow the South African economy, but uh, the region and the continent. We're taking a short break on this Russia-South Africa investment opportunity discussion. And when we return, we delve into more touch points between these two territories. You're watching CNBC Africa here. We're coming to you from the sidelines of the BRICS summit, which is currently in session in Johannesburg, South Africa. back to this live debate on Russia-South Africa investment opportunities coming to you from the sidelines of the BRICS summit which is currently in session in Johannesburg, South Africa. Joining me on stage, Mr. Paul Mashatile, Treasurer General of the African National Congress, Mr. Kirill Lipa, CEO, Transmash Holding Group, we are joined also now by Mr. Andrew Lane, who is a partner at Deloitte Africa, and Mr. Mark Partridge, Vice President of Gazprom Bank. Thank you very much uh, for joining us. And Andrew, thank you for your time on stage. Perhaps we can get your thoughts on the topic at hand, Russia, South Africa, and if you can weigh in from your experience and from that Deloitte perspective. So, so thank you, Bronwyn. I, I think... We find ourselves in a situation where global trade relations are, are becoming quite interesting. You know, we've got a sort of a fragmenting situation on the world, in the world. And um, I mean, I think that poses a threat in the sense that some of the bigger markets are now closing up. I think there's also the, the, the potential threat that some big manufacturers are now looking for alternative markets. Um, but in terms of the opportunity it presents, I think there is an opportunity for bilateral trade between the two countries, intra-BRICS trade, I think the BRICS construct is important, and a point that was raised earlier around there may be an opportunity to create a, a trading block which actually has the, the, the gravitas to actually start to determine the agenda of, of global trade and drive things more towards our own, our own benefits. In terms of, of what the opportunities might be, for, particularly for inbound investment into, into Africa, I think one of the, one of the challenges in, in bilateral trade between Russia and South Africa is we're both commodity-dependent economies. 
So I think you know, when it comes to bilateral trade, we need to be quite thoughtful about how we do that in a way which creates jobs and improves livelihoods in our countries. I also think that there's, there's an opportunity to think about, you know, the world is innovating so fast that the commodities that are relevant now may not be relevant in the future. So I do think there's an opportunity to think about what is going to be relevant in the future and how do we turn that to our advantage. We, the resource endowment we have is the resource endowment we have, so we need to think about how we turn that to effect in, in the evolving world. Just if we can pause there for yeah. a second, really we're talking about, about beneficiation, industrialization, if we are commodity dependent from both the Russia and South Africa perspective. That's where we've got to get the best practice and share best practice in terms to fast track the industrialization manufacturing aspect. That's exactly the point. Uh, you know, I mean, the reason we want to trade with other people is so that we can create jobs and improve livelihoods at home. And I think all parties in these multilateral or bilateral agreements are trying to achieve that. Um, so we need to make sure that that's what we get out of it at the end. You were going to make another point before I really interrupt. So, I, gonna, uh, you know, so I think we've spoken about the commodity opportunities. Um, you know, we, we are a, a commodity-rich continent. There's a lot of, sh you know, we've got shell gas in South Africa. I think there's a while to go before it becomes clear what the regulatory frameworks are going to be there. I think it's, we're a continent that is, that is um, desperately in need of infrastructure investment. We've spoken about energy, rail, port, roads. Um, there are um, a, lot of, a lot of needs and opportunities for investment into those sectors. And I think another thing too that we should bear in mind is that we have, you know, we're, we're a continent where GDP is growing. We do have a growing population and we have a very young population relative to some of the developed world. So that creates a, an upswing in consumer demand. And I think maybe there's something we could think about bilaterally to, to harness that across the continent. To harness youth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Treasurer General reserving the tough questions for you, sir. The uh, nuclear uh, deal yes. which has been stopped, and, and that seemed to be very much at the center stage of South yeah. Africa-Russia relations. Yeah. Has that had a negative impact? What are your thoughts in terms of the fallout from that situation? I'm not aware of any tension between us and Russia on, on this deal. Um, the confusion is that uh, many people thought we want to do the deal with Russia or we don't want to do it. That's not the issue, actually. The issue was affordability. Uh, remember, nuclear is part of our energy mix. Uh, we think it's uh, clean energy and and can be affordable. But I think the approach that we will take going forward is to avoid the Big Bang approach. Uh, the initial intervention was that we will do close to 10,000 megawatts, which may have cost us more than 1.8 trillion rents. It's unaffordable. So we probably will take a different approach. Uh, and once we are clear that this is affordable for us to do, we are open for business, including with Russia. But it, it, it hasn't had any negative consequences in your view? No, because Russia is aware that uh, um, if it's affordable, we will do it. And you did mention that President Putin is expected yeah. any moment now. We will engage with them. Mark, let's come back to you. Uh, earlier we heard Kirill, Kirill talking about uh, the infrastructure development that is required as the, the base case for investment, especially if you're in an in entrepreneurial phase. Uh, can you give me your sense of what you require from an investment perspective or what you advise the companies that you are working with to look for before they enter into a territory? Sure. Uh, I think we, we have uh, accompanied and we've been proudly financing a huge development in infrastructure in, in Russia over the past uh, 10 years. Uh, Russia introduced in, uh, in 2005 a law on concessions and laws on public-private partnerships. And at first people were a little bit hesitant because they didn't know exactly, well, okay, there is a law, but how do we apply it, how does it work? And, but <coughs> step by step, project by project, uh, we are now uh, financing all kinds of projects from roads, from railways, uh, hospitals, kindergartens, uh, the, the whole range. Uh, and I think that uh, uh, there has been a very strong experience in South Africa as well in, in public-private partnerships and the development of infrastructure. And I think we've reached a degree of maturity where uh, there is a lot to share and a lot to do t together. 
Uh, and uh, we, are, uh, we, we see that as, as an avenue of growth. Uh, trade, and we were talking about how to grow the numbers of trade between Russia and, uh, and South Africa. I think a lot of the, this growth will come through investment and long-term investment uh, into infrastructure uh, and working with companies like Transmesh Holding, for example, uh, in their development in, in South Africa and throughout Africa is a very good example of how we can build this cooperation because, as, as was said, this is not just a question of import-export, this is a question of really building an infrastructure and doing it together. Carol, we spoke about the half a billion rand investment that you've just announced from a Transmash holding perspective. But we're not the only country that you're investing in. And I, I suppose the question here is how do we compare to the other investment territories? I know Argentina is a, sp a focus for you. It would just be interesting to get your sense as to how we compare because capital flows where capital is welcome. Mm. <laughs> well, let me a little bit avoid of um, any kind of comparison between di different countries. Uh, our idea is uh, to focus on a certain countries, not to try to cover all the world at the same time, first of all. Secondly, we are looking uh, to develop ourselves in the countries where we see the big opportunities uh, for the um, development of the competence of the rolling stock. And what I wanted to uh, draw your attention is that the markets always uh, has ups and downs. So you, for sure, uh, it's absolutely right that we are very commodity-oriented countries and economies. But what is much more important is that the competence which is developed in the country is, stays with this country forever. And uh, this mm -hmm. helps uh, to not to start from the scratch and from, from the very beginning, but uh, when the economy is growing, you can immediately follow this growth. And we see the same story in our country and in our industry. So we can enlarge our business, uh, and I would say in a very short period of time. For example, we have 40 percentage of growth by comparison to the last year. And we do it just within one year. So it's all those who are in the industry understand that it's physically impossible if you are not deeply involved into this business. So that's why our understanding is that, for example, if we come to Argentina, our idea is not, once again, not to bring some commodities or to bring some rolling stock from Russia or from anywhere else, but to, to develop local competence and local knowledge of uh, the production. Then you can follow ups and downs very fast and you can be very close to the needs of the economy. The same idea here in Africa. So, we see the opportunity to build the competence of rolling stock production here. We see the growing economy and we see huge potential not only in South Africa but in the whole region. So, and we see the opportunities to develop this competence here. That's why we want to, to, to do it. And yes, we, we do some business in Argentina, but I would say that um, the fact that, uh, how to say, we were more in, uh, in an advanced stage there, it's just a matter of consequences of, I don't know, of some mm -hmm. obstacles. It's not a strategy to be there first and here second or to make any comparison. So it's just a matter of time, I would say, that we will be here and we will develop here. Well said. And, and Andrew, let's pick up on that. Local competence and local knowledge, the development of those elements really go to what you were speaking about earlier and job creation. This would be win-win if we all have that uh, mandate at the forefront. Yeah, well, you know, I think that you know, the, the field is quite big. Uh, and so I think it's important to be very thoughtful about where we target investment. And obviously, you're looking for those places which are going to give a return to the shareholder, but also create benefit for, for the, the, the host country and, and the people that live in it. I'm going to open up to audience questions and uh, statements. We do have a roving mic, so please, if you want to make uh, a contribution to our conversation this morning, uh, raise your hand. I know, Judy, I'm going to get a mic to you straight away. Uh, Judy Nokwedi uh, is from Tourvest, and uh, earlier she had some very interesting stats to share on Russia-South Africa relations. 
Thank you very much. And I'd like to turn the sector away from infrastructure, mining, and commodities to the new gold in South Africa, which is tourism. South Africa has identified tourism as a major driver for economic growth, as well as job creation. And we as Tuerves, a South African company with an African footprint, have just come back from Russia, where we've, where we've had a, a, a tremendously successful uh, season. We were a South African company that won some major work during the World Cup. And to give you a sense of what we've done in Russia was we managed over 45,000 guests. We had a st staff complement of 761 people. We managed 50 hotels in Moscow, 88 hotels regionally, and I can go on and on. So what is important in this conversation is the opportunities on both sides of the oceans. And we believe we've built up some solid expertise in Russia with the World Cup in the destination sports management arena. We also play in East Africa, where our expertise is in lodging and lodge, lodge building, lodge management and activities. So, so we I'm need to pull leverage on that, those opportunities. That, the, the sports element, because obviously mm -hmm. that has been front and center stage for many of us uh, over the last couple of months. In terms of the value, the, the exchange of people that you've seen, has it been facilitated by the relaxation of the visa requirements that uh, were dropped in May 2017? Well, notwithstanding the visa challenges, and there have been very interesting developments now at BRICS to relax these um, barriers to, to, to entry in respective countries. So I think um, some of the major drivers around the slight decrease in our May 2017 and May 2018 stats is, is a host of um, areas, notwithstanding the visa, strengthening of the euro, strengthening of the dollar, um, austerity across. But I think what is important is everyone on the panel talked about cultural differences and how do you bridge cultural differences? It's through travel. When we visit your home and you visit our home, we begin to realize that more things bind us and unite us that keep us separate. And that is why it's important for us to travel Great. and experience those softer, each other's countries. Those softer touch points. Can I get uh, other thoughts on the conversation at hand, other contributors to the conversation? I've got a hand up there. Thank you very much. Thank you for your contribution. And please feel free, if you would like to direct a question to any of our panelists, uh, do go ahead and uh, deploy. Good morning, my name is Larat Mulebazi and I am with General Electric South Africa. Um, my, mine is, a, is both a question and a comment um, and I would like to ask uh, the TG. The, 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 whole, the whole question of investment opportunities between South Africa and Russia um, I think is a fantastic one. The opportunities are immense. Um, however, I, I do think that in the absence of a public-private partnership framework that we as the <coughs> private sector um, can look at, which will define exactly how government is going to engage with the private sector in order to ensure that these uh, investment opportunities don't, don't slip between the cracks, I think is an important one. And I, my question is, how far are we uh, with creating that kind of framework where that, that level of engagement um, can happen? My let, me, let me take that question first. TG, can you respond in terms of the public-private framework in terms of facilitating investment mm -hmm. opportunities, Russia, South Africa? Well, South Africa does have a, a public-private partnership framework that we use. Obviously, we need to compare with what Russia has. Uh, uh, and remember, one thing that strengthens trade is also the availability of finance uh, for participants. Uh, so I'm glad that we do have a Russian bank already in South Africa. And if South African companies go to Russia, we must also look at how they access funding. But th indeed, uh, we will look at that framework to the extent that it must make business easier for our companies to to be able to operate in Russia is something that the, the, the business council should look into and engage with government. 
Mark, is there an over-reliance on government dependency? I mean, here on the panel, we've got private sector participants, political leadership, mm -hmm. but we've got entrepreneurs leading the way when it comes to investment. So it's almost sometimes that we wait a little too much or we weigh on government a little too much to fast-track solutions when the private sector can do so themselves. Oh, absolutely. The, the private sector uh, is ultimately the key to, to the investment. Uh, what the, what the, the, the public sector can do is to lay the framework and, and make it easier. And, and uh, I think there, the governments within the BRICS organizations can cooperate, for example, to make, it, uh, to make the South African uh, PPP framework more understandable to Russian companies. But ultimately, it is for... Uh, Russian companies uh, that are interested in expanding beyond what they've been doing at home to look into, in, into this and, 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 and they will take the initiative. What we can do as a bank is to help them understand these opportunities and that's why we are trying to organize the dialogue, that's why we accompany our clients when they come to, to South Africa, that's why we are ready to help South African companies understanding Russia and the opportunities that exist in, uh, in Russia. So there is a role for, for the public sector, there's a role for the, for the entrepreneurs and the, the investors and there's a role for, for the financial institutions such as us to, to help mediate this and then create the, uh, the, the, the financial framework that, that will make it possible to invest. Andrew, can you weigh in? So look, um, you know, I think there is a role for government. Um, I think the, the free marketeers would argue, would argue that, uh, that the, less, the, smaller the role, smaller role government plays, the better. I think for me what's critically important is you know, on both sides of this discussion, we all have alternatives. And I think for both countries to, to, to understand that we actually need to be attractive to the other party. Uh, and we need to be investor friendly and receptive to, to incoming investor. And, and, and I, th I think that's just a, a basic rule of economics. I'm going to just move to this side of the room. I don't want to miss anybody that wants to contribute to the conversation. Any hands up here? The other side of the room, thank you very much. If we could deploy a mic over there. Kirill, just while we're getting the mic, while we're on public sector, private sector, your thoughts? My thoughts are that uh, every country has uh, their own experience and understanding of this cooperation, and it's quite important uh, to establish the certain rules and certain traditions in this kind of cooperation. I feel that our country has quite interesting experience, and we will be more than glad to share it with uh, our colleagues here. Thank you, Carol. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. My name is Yamkela Makupula. I'm a partner at PwC. Uh, my question is not is related to everybody sitting there, and I hope the companies from Russia, they can also give us their perspective. So one of the things uh, as a growing economy that we've identified in order for us to be able to get to a place where we have a balanced economy and everybody's participating in it, is for us to focus on investing in our small businesses and the emerging businesses. And with now the BRICS agenda that is happening, which is exciting for us in South Africa, how do we make sure that in these big investments that are coming into our country, these small businesses and these emerging companies get an opportunity to participate uh, it, because it will bring the value on the other side. So from a Russia perspective, how have you seen that happening? And TG, uh, from our side, I know from a policy perspective, we've worked very hard on that. I know with Invest SA and also with the DTI, but is there any other things that you can share uh, for these businesses to participate from a BRICS perspective? Thank you. Thank you very much for that question. Of course, small businesses, SMEs, mm. the lifeblood of our economies. It, indeed, uh, <clears throat> I'm one of the strongest supporters of uh, small businesses. I think it, it makes sense to drive economic growth involving small businesses. In fact, um, as you know, that South Africa even has a ministry <clears throat> and a department that supports small businesses. Uh, I do hope that in the period of the BRICS summit that uh, the Business Council will ensure that small businesses are invited to these sessions to meet uh, possible potential partners and so on. So yes, we agreed. Let's, let's get the small business right at the center of what we do. 
Carol, just on that, small businesses from a Russian perspective, are they at the center of the economy? What could we learn? Is there anything that you'd like to share on that front in terms of what small businesses mean to the Russian economy? Well, for us, uh, this topic is quite uh, also on the agenda and we quite often discuss it uh, in our country. Uh, the problem of Russian Federation is that uh, our economy was worse, very centralized. So typically we had huge industries and huge plants and uh, they were in locomotive, for example, industry we were joking that we can get iron ore and we can produce locomotive. So it's, and it's just half of, of this joke is joke. So the second half is, uh, is reality. So that's why for us uh, the development of the middle class and of uh, the how to say, small or medium sized uh, companies is quite important. We're trying to find the way how to do it. We're trying to, do, to find the way how to cooperate because uh, for small companies it's quite difficult to cooperate with big giants uh, with huge bureaucracy. They have no time to spend in all you know how to say offices to wait until they will be given some contracts or something like that. Uh, the same story with the banks, the same story with the limits, financing, the same story with political support. So it's quite difficult, but it's very important. I think that uh, modern world is all about the speed. So the faster you move, the better results you have. And flexibility is very important. And the only company which can follow this flexibility and speed is medium sized company because for them it's much more easier to be very oriented on the client needs and on the real economical situation. They can do it immediately. Not uh, the situation of big companies uh, like we are for example. So we need time to restructure ourselves, to restructure our strategy, to restructure our production sites and our business. So that's why I think that for all the economies in the world it's quite important. It's quite difficult, challenging, so, but we have to, to do it anyway. Mark, you're signaling you want to come in here? Yes, 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 absolutely. Uh, I have to say, th this is essentially uh, a, a question of efficiency. Uh, in order for uh, this interaction to work between Russian and South African companies, uh, we cannot do it just a level of one or two companies together. There's going to be a complementarity of different tasks, and a lot of this capacity does come from small and medium enterprises. Uh, only the day before yesterday, I, I had the chance to visit, and I was extremely impressed with um, uh, some uh, South African enterprises in the aerospace sector that are doing remarkable things. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the ability to integrate and to use this experience is key to providing efficient solutions. We are used in doing project finance uh, to, to look at contracts that uh, on the commercial structure tend to be very complex with a lot of people playing in and the key is to get the best people to work uh, together in, in, in an efficient way and these are the Mark, companies that will make it happen. Mark, I'm going to need to interject. three minutes to close of broadcast. I want to go to closing comments and I want, to, Andrew, you to start with closing comments. We are going to be looking at the key message that you would like to leave our audience tuning in from 48 countries across the African continent right now. Obviously, we have a huge South African mm. audience watching. When it comes to Russia, South Africa, investment opportunities, what would you like to leave the audience with, sir? So, so my closing comment would be there's a lot of opportunity. Um, and what, what is critical is to be very choiceful, both as individual nations and, and, and as a collective, where we place our bets in order to create the returns that we want for ourselves and to uplift livelihoods in our countries. Mark. My key message is do not be afraid to look at uh, opportunities in, in cooperation. Uh, you may not always be used to all the possibilities that come from Russia or Russians may not always be used to all the opportunities in Africa, but there's so much that we can do together. Carol. Well, I would say that the uh, world is ch changing changing quite fast, so less talks, more ac actions. <laughs> less talk, more action, I like that. Short and sweet and on the point. <coughs> Treasurer General, final word to you, sir. Well, I want to say that there's a new dawn now in South Africa and South Africa is open for business. So you are all welcome. <laughs> Thank you. 
So welcome to the new dawn in South Africa. Less talk, more action. Thank you very much for joining us for this live debate coming to you from the sidelines of the BRICS Summit in Johannesburg, South Africa. And thank you very much for tuning in to this CNBC Africa broadcast on investment opportunities between Russia and South Africa.